The last two lectures have looked at subsistence and the economy. These two social institutions satisfy people's basic needs. Now, with those needs met, we can start talking about how people form relationships and groups. For the next several weeks, leading up to and after the midterm, we'll be examining social organization. Social organization is how individuals within a society are tied together through cultural ideas how the statuses and roles that make up society are organized to provide the full range of activities and behaviors necessary for biological and cultural survival. This lecture's topic in particular is gender, but before I dive into that, let's review a bit. Society refers to all the relationships that people form among themselves and among groups in order to make a living. Social organization operates on a variety of levels, the largest of which is the social institution, which is easier to grasp by examples than by giving a definition. Politics, religion, the household, the family, etc. These are all social institutions. Here we'll be dealing with the institution of gender. But institutions are not the basic units of social organization. Those are social statuses. Statuses are social positions that identify the people involved in the different kinds of interactions in that institution. Man and woman are both statuses that are part of the institution of gender. Every person in society occupies many statuses simultaneously, but different statuses are relevant in different situations. A role is a set of behaviors, obligations, and rights that make up a particular status. For example, the status of father comes with the obligation to raise children, the right to make decisions for them, and it implies certain kinds of behavior like working to provide food and shelter. Much of what we're talking about here will have to do with gender roles. So with that framework in mind, let's start talking about gender and see how it contributes to society as a whole. The first thing to note is that gender exists only because humans reproduce sexually. There are two kinds of human being, male and female, who differ biologically. The human species displays sexual dimorphism, dimorphic, two forms. Males tend to be taller, have more upper body strength, and generally have a larger frame. Females have smaller frames, but broader hips. But all of these biological differences are swamped by the number of other differences between men and women. The great majority of these differences are attributable to culture, not biology. Gender, in the anthropological sense, refers to the social status one holds by virtue of being biologically male, female, or something else. It is the way that a culture interprets and makes use of biological sex. Because culture and biology are two very different, though related, things, I will follow a convention that your textbook doesn't. Following several prominent anthropologists of gender, I contrast male and female, which are sexual labels referring to biological traits, with man and woman, which refer to gender, the cultural interpretations of that biology. This convention helps us to differentiate the biological and cultural dimensions in our own thinking and communication. Not doing so can often lead to vague thinking, confusion, and misunderstanding. The current controversies surrounding gender in our wider culture arise largely because many Americans use gender and sex interchangeably. In your textbook, Kotak also uses man-woman and female-male interchangeably which makes some of his definitions and discussion more confusing than it really needs to be. In this lecture, I've modified his definitions to follow my convention. So, in every society, there is an institution of gender, all the relationships that surround this concept. Making up that institution are at least two gender statuses, culturally recognized and institutionalized forms of gender which we normally translate to English as man and woman. Because culture is different from biology though, there may also be a third gender status, a fourth or even more. Gender roles then are the behaviors, obligations, and rights assigned to a gender status. If you're a man, what sorts of things do you do? 
What does it mean to be a woman? Your textbook also discusses several other terms and concepts that are closely tied to the idea of gender roles. Gender stereotypes are oversimplified, strongly held views about the characteristics of men and women. Gender identity is a person's identification by self and others as man, woman, or something else. Gender identity is as much about psychology as it is about social relationships. Finally, gender stratification refers to the unequal distribution of social resources between men and women. Gender stratification especially is the focus of research for many anthropologists of gender. But why are gender roles necessary at all? All known societies divide behaviors between at least two genders, though the degree to which the behavior is appropriate to one gender or another varies widely. For example, your textbook talks about the Arapesh, a New Guinea tribe studied by Margaret Mead. The Arapesh had very few gender differences, with men and women largely behaving much the same and doing the same sorts of things. On the other end of the spectrum are, for example, traditional Arabic cultures, where women's roles are radically different from men's and very closely controlled. So all cultures divide things up into men's work and women's work. That isn't especially surprising. What's more surprising is that many cultures do it with a pretty high degree of consistency. Table 9.1 on page 184 in your textbook gives some of the most common patterns cross-culturally for dividing gender roles. This table comes from another textbook, but it gives a more detailed description of the patterns. The first thing we have to notice is that this table also conflates gender and sex, so we need first to change the column headings. Now that we've done that, we can see some surprising patterns. Men are usually the hunters, leaders, and makers in most societies. Women deal with plant foods, childcare, and domestic chores. Why? Why shouldn't men be the ones to do the laundry? Why shouldn't women make musical instruments? There are a variety of theories as to why these patterns should show up repeatedly around the world. The explanation that usually leaps to mind first is called the strength theory. On average, males are stronger than females, so men perform the tasks that require most strength and endurance. This theory is attractive on the surface, but it's easy to find problems with it. First, not all of the activities almost always performed by men require great strength. How does making a musical instrument require strength and endurance? Second, what about strong women? While males on average are stronger than females on average, the range of strengths within each sex is very great. Many females at the upper end of their range are stronger than many males at the lower end of their range. So if strength were the only factor in determining who does what, we'd maybe expect a slight preference for males in some roles, but we'd also expect many females to perform them. Also, if a lack of strength prohibits females from doing men's jobs, what prevents males from doing women's work? A much better explanation of gender differences focuses less on differences of quantity, how much strength, and more on qualitative differences, the things that one sex can do that the other fundamentally cannot. According to the compatibility with childcare theory, females must give birth to and nurse infants, so women perform only those duties that are compatible with those biological roles. These are the tasks that can generally be done close to the home, that do not place children in undue danger, and that can easily be interrupted when children demand attention. Men perform the tasks that aren't compatible with children. For example, hunting, which is dangerous. It can't be interrupted by a crying child, and it requires men to range far from home. Women care for children while cooking and laundering around the house, safe from enemies and dangerous predators. They can set those tasks aside from time to time to care for the kids and pick them up again when they can. 
This theory doesn't explain every cross-cultural gender role, but it explains much more than the strength theory. If child care helps explain the cross-cultural patterns and gender roles, it may also play a part in explaining the worldwide patterns of gender stratification. It's no secret that in some societies, women are completely subordinate to men and in others, the genders enjoy much more equality. What is perhaps more surprising is that these patterns are not necessarily related to more general patterns of social inequality. For example, there's relatively little gender stratification among the Minangkabau of Indonesia, despite the society being a highly stratified kingdom with a hereditary nobility and a peasantry. Meanwhile, among the politically and economically egalitarian Yanomami, women were traditionally treated as property of their men. So what causes gender stratification? Work in the 1970s, especially a series of classic papers by Sande and Friedel, showed that gender stratification was closely tied to subsistence strategy, at least among hunter-gatherers. In cultures where women and men contributed roughly equal amounts of food, and especially meat, to the diet, gender stratification was low. In those societies where men provided almost all of the meat, women were subordinate. This is tied ultimately to the women's restriction to certain kinds of work due to child rearing. Men can hunt and travel away from home, so they acquire rarer, more valuable goods such as meat. By making gifts of that meat to others outside the household, men turn their wealth into prestige and esteem. This gives them control over decision making. Women, tied as they are to their children and their home, are left out, but only if the subsistence strategy relies on men and their hunting. Aside from subsistence, gender stratification shows up most obviously in politics and leadership. Politics is the process of making decisions that affect the entire group. Leaders are those people who have the power to make those decisions. The extent to which women participate in politics varies widely from one culture to another, from some hunter-gatherer societies where women have essentially the same amount of power as men, to say, the Taliban's Afghanistan, where women had almost no power at all. But the one constant pattern across all cultures is that leaders are men more often than women. Even in matrilineal cultures, such as the Minangkabau, where kinship is reckoned through the mother's line and women frequently own all the property, political decision-making power is more often found in men in this case the mothers, brothers, and sisters' sons, than it is found in women. We'll talk more about the details later this unit. Some societies can legitimately be called patriarchy, which the textbook defines as a political system ruled by men, in which women have inferior social and political status, including basic human rights. Political authority is assigned almost completely to men, and women are specifically and explicitly excluded from politics. Arabic cultures are good examples of patriarchies. Victorian Europe is a less good example, but still makes a lot of sense. Most patriarchies also typify the patrilineal patrilocal complex, also known as patrifocal societies. In these societies, the political structure centering on men is paralleled by a social structure that calculates descent and assigns residence based on men as well. Such a patrifocal system is probably related to prevalent warfare, since it keeps closely related men together to form strong, tightly integrated armies. In other societies, women participate much more in politics. Such societies are sometimes called partner societies. Many Native American societies were partner societies when Europeans first made contact. Women did not dominate politics, and they were excluded from some leadership positions. But there were also positions specifically for women leaders, and women as a group generally had almost as much political power as men. The Hopi of Arizona are a good example of a partner society. The Arapesh in New Guinea are another example. 
our modern Western society is trending in that direction. But in all the ethnographic record, through as much of the human past as we can reconstruct, there has never been a matriarchy, at least not if we define it parallel to patriarchy. There has never been a political system ruled by women in which men have inferior social and political status, including basic human rights. There is, on the other hand, a lot of highly politicized rhetoric about matriarchies in the distant past and among non-Western societies today. Your textbook even discusses Sande's argument that the Menankabau are a matriarchy. Katak says, Sande considers the Menankabau a matriarchy because women are the center, origin, and foundation of the social order. But note what happened there. Matriarchy became a term describing social relationships, not political decision-making. This is actually a pretty good definition of a matrifocal society. The Menankabau are matrilineal, matrilocal, and women do enjoy a very prominent role in Menankabau politics, precisely because they are the foundation of the social order. But a man still ruled as king in the Menankabau kingdom, and even lower level clan chiefs are always men. So rather than a matriarchy, Menankabau society actually fits much better the concept of a partner society, somewhat dominated by men. If you don't play games with definitions and you keep the definition of matriarchy the inversion of the definition of patriarchy, there simply is not a matriarchy anywhere in the ethnographic record. So why hasn't there ever been a matriarchy? It probably traces back to those same arguments by Friedel and Sande about gender stratification. If hunter-gatherer women were locked out of creating prestige through gift giving, hunter-gatherer men got an early advantage in creating the kinds of networks of friends that could be turned into political followings. They created a social system that placed them in positions of political authority early on in human history, and those systems have remained largely in place ever since. Interestingly enough, in recent years, technology has allowed some women to create the kinds of networks that were previously the domain of men, and in cultures where that has happened, man-dominated politics have become much more egalitarian. Another topic that is often of great interest to new anthropology students is the idea of third or alternate genders. Remember, while sex is a biological fact that allows for very little ambiguity between male and female, gender is a cultural interpretation of sex that can allow for more than simply two gender statuses. All societies ascribe, or assign, people a gender status at birth, which in English we call men and women, or since we're talking about infants, boys and girls. But some societies allow for flexibility of gender status later in life, where the individual can choose to take on a different gender. In anthropological terms, everyone is ascribed a gender at birth, but some achieve a different gender later. Of course, not every culture recognizes this as a possibility. Now, since your textbook doesn't maintain a strict distinction between gender and sex throughout the chapter, I think its discussion on pages 194 to 198 is a bit more confusing than it could be. I'll try to clarify a bit. Two main terms that are important to understanding alternate genders. The first is intersex, which the textbook defines as pertaining to a group of conditions reflecting a discrepancy between external and internal genitals. It then goes on to discuss primarily chromosomal differences, which you'll notice chromosomes are not genitals. So a better way to think of intersex individuals is that they are those people who, for whatever reason, are not clearly biologically male or female. Many intersex individuals are not obviously intersex. Often the differences are minor, hormonal, or internal. Such individuals may go their entire lives without knowing that they are intersex, or if they do know, they might be perfectly content with whichever gender status was ascribed to them at birth and continue to identify as such. Others who are more obviously intersex may be ascribed a third gender at birth, 
or they may choose to adopt a different gender status later in life. If intersex is the biological side of the issue, transgender is the cultural side. The textbook defines transgender as describing individuals whose gender identity contradicts their biological sex at birth and the gender identity assigned to them in infancy. That is, transgender individuals are those who are ascribed one gender at birth, but who later in life choose a different gender status. The self-identified gender does not necessarily have to be either man or woman, and frequently around the world, it is a third option. Examples of third genders are common in many cultures around the world. The Hijra in northern India are biological males who are neither men nor women. They have often been castrated and take on women's dress and mannerisms. However, they're not culturally women as they don't marry and they play public roles outside the home, things that Indian women do not do. Several Native American cultures in the West and Southwest have a similar gender status called Burdashe among the Zuni. Burdashes do marry men, but again play roles in the community that women cannot. Biological females can also adopt third genders, so-called sworn virgins in some Balkan societies are females who adopt certain masculine traits, but who, as the hijras in India, do not marry. Our own society also recognizes the possibility of a person being transgender, but unlike the other examples, there has traditionally been no broadly recognized third gender. Instead, transgendered males act insofar as possible as women, and transgendered females act as men. Modern Western medicine has even made it possible for a person to have surgery to change his or her genitals to match the biological sex traditionally associated with his or her own gender identity. Although this isn't a widespread convention, it is helpful to think of the term transsexual as applying to those who've undergone such biological changes. Transsexuals would be a subset of the transgendered in that case. There's one more thing to think about with respect to transgendered individuals, and that's institutionalization in the anthropological sense. Today, in our society, it's fairly widely accepted that some individuals are transgender, and that's simply part of how our society works. But just because an individual chooses to self-identify as a different gender, that doesn't mean that the rest of the community must accept the idea. In the past, in the West, and currently in some parts of the world, transgenderism would be considered pathological, a disease or aberration that needed fixing. In the case that most members of the culture accept and recognize transgenderism as part of society, we say that it's part of the society's institution of gender. So anywhere a third gender exists, it's institutionalized. But in those places where transgenderism is rejected by the community at large, we say that there are only two institutionalized genders. That doesn't mean that transgendered individuals don't exist in that society, only that the community at large does not recognize them as belonging to the gender that they self-identify as. Finally, before I end this lecture, I want to talk about sex in the sense of sexuality. Sex being so basic to our nature as a biological species is something that seems like it wouldn't vary much from culture to culture. In fact, sexuality is something that varies greatly across cultures. How a culture defines sexuality, what sorts of sexual relationships it allows, and how those relationships play out are almost infinitely variable. In the interest of time, I'll just leave that section of the text to you with the reminder that everything in the textbook is fair game for the exam. But to wrap this discussion of gender up, we can see that gender is tightly interwoven with many aspects of daily life, from subsistence to politics to economy. It's a deeply important part of personal identity in any culture, and it plays a basic role in how we form most other kinds of relationships. Next lecture, we'll see how gender is vital to forming kinship bonds.